Afternoon, thank you for coming. Um, you've arrived at After Darwin. To what extent is the theory of natural selection somehow a relic? Is it too narrow and about to be replaced by a new science of, that includes cultural evolution? Or does the promised paradigm shift not really challenge Darwin's theory? To help us <coughs> answer that, I've got Zanna Clay. She's a comparative and developmental psychologist with expertise in primatology, which means she studies chimps. And bonobos. And bonobos, right. With a real focus on empathy, language, and social learning in the animals. In animals and in children. Excellent. Um, on my left, we have Massimo Piliucci. He's a professor of philosophy at CUNY, which is City College in New York. Uh, he's one of the leading advocates of the extended evolutionary synthesis, which he will no doubt tell us about. A new way of thinking about and understanding evolutionary phenomena. To his left, um, we have Tim Lewins, who's a professor of philosophy of science at Cambridge, um, and he's an investigator on the large multi-institution project, putting the extended evolutionary synthesis to the test. Tim, do you want to start us off? Can our current theories capture the full richness of evolution? So it would be nuts to say that our, full, uh, our current theories can capture the full richness of evolution. That would be an example of the worst kind of scientific hubris, just like those physicists who thought that physics was over at the end of the 19th century and then got bashed by relativity theory and quantum mechanics. There are, however, some really interesting developments going on in evolutionary biology right now. Uh, there's extremely interesting attention, not just to genes, but to the mushy insides of organisms and the difference that that makes to adaptation. There's extremely interesting work, such as the work that Zana does, for example, on cultural evolution, a realization that uh, differences between organisms, uh, including adaptive differences between organisms, are often explained by what they learn rather than by the genes that they pass on. That said, a lot of that work doesn't really uh, challenge uh, evolutionary theory all that much, it seems to me. In fact, in some ways, some of that work is extremely conservative with respect to the current models or the sort of more traditional models that we have. So a lot of work in cultural evolution, for example, yes, it talks about the interesting ways in which animals learn from each other. But when you ask, where do those learning dispositions come from in the first place? The answer is, it's just more natural selection acting on genetic variation. And some of the really radical views in these areas also credit learning with an active role in shaping how we learn as well as just what we learn. Evolution uh, is has, it's a moving target. We shouldn't think that what's going on right now is this kind of key moment of revolution. Uh, Darwin's theory itself uh, changed in all kinds of ways compared with what we have now. Uh, but yes, there are interesting things happening right now, but no revolution, it seems to me. Okay, Massimo, what do you think? Can our current theories capture the full richness of evolution? I, I, I take the current theories to mean kind of the gene-centered approach. Right, no. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, no, they don't. And for the, the same reasons we, ju we just heard, that is, you know, no scientific theory re really, not, none at the moment, at least not in the history of science, has ever captured everything. Uh, you know, that's true in modern fundamental physics, just, just as, as much as it was at the end of the 19th century, and it's certainly true in biology. What I do think is that one of the things that has characterized biology so far, this, this, this could change, uh, but unlike other fields such as physics, uh, there hasn't been any complete overturn of essentially Darwinian ideas. Uh, you know, we got the evolution of biology started with Darwin, essentially, and what Darwin said still goes. Uh, more complex, more mechanisms, more phenomena, uh, lots of stuff that Darwin obviously did not know or could not know about. Uh, but the foundations are still the same, as opposed to, say, uh, in physics, where you know, Newtonian mechanics is out the window uh, when, once that general relativity came in. Um, it's used now only for, for practical purposes because it gives good approximation. But the, the picture of the, of the universe that, it, that Newtonian mechanics gives us is, in fact, wrong, and it's been abandoned. Nothing like that yet has happened in biology. Now, this could be because biology is a field that is younger than physics uh, in that respect. Uh, or it may be because that one really did get something fundamental right, and we're just building on, uh, on what he's done. Well, there's a slight difference in saying he was, he, he, he was right, but did he capture all of that there is? No. Right. Is some of the stuff that he might have not have been aware of trivial or important? I think it's important. 
marvelous. There is something to talk about. I'm sure you're glad. <laughs> Zana, what, what right, yeah. I mean, to be honest, we, I think we all agree um, here that I think that we shouldn't ever assume any theory can explain everything, particularly in the complex world we live in. And the fact that the more stuff we study in terms of evolution and other aspects of, of, of biology, the more we realize there's more and more questions that need to be answered. And so I think it would be a bad scientist to assume that we have all the answers. What I do think, though, is that while there's a lot of richness that we still need to understand, I think, to me, the Darwinian principle of natural selection does go a, it seems to be going a very long way to explain some of the ultimate um, principles of evolution that we're still continuing to see. And what I sort of feel as an empirical researcher is that um, we've got this really strong basis um, that I, d I don't feel that uh, there's any strong evidence yet to suggest that we should move away from or abandon. I think nobody in evolutionary uh, research is arguing that we should abandon Darwin. Maybe people's view of evolution is a little bit oversimplified and the theories that we're now using to understand evolution have massively expanded since Darwin. Um, there's a huge expanse in our understanding uh, and, it's, and evolutionary theory is moving in all sorts of interesting directions. Um, but I do think that there's some things like, for example, the cultural lives of animals, which is something I study, uh, is not something that was ever really truly appreciated, how profoundly important that might be in shaping behavior. So I do think we need to expand theories, but um, I don't find um, so far, maybe we can discuss that, whether we need to abandon what we've built so far um, rather than expand our our appreciation of these, these other effects that perhaps weren't explained um, when, for example, the modern synthesis of evolution was first developed. Right. But when you, I mean, you study, you mentioned the cultural evolution yeah. of animals or empathy. Yeah. A sort of very reductionistic version of that. Say, well, there must be a gene for empathy. I or, mean, yeah. But, but do they inherit but nobody's empathy? nobody's saying that. I don't know any scientist that would, would say that. No, but... It's often characterized oh, that way. Do you? I mean, okay, if they do, <laughs> then I okay. think, okay, I disagree with those kind of scientists. Well, I'm not going to necessarily name okay, names, but, but I mean, you know, I think Richard like, Dawkins, sorry, I've okay. never named names. But. <laughs> well, I do have a problem with kind of reductionism to that extent and like genetic okay. determinism, but I don't think that's what most people in the field are debating. Okay, but yeah. that's fine. But it, it is, I suppose, that ghost of Richard yeah. Dawkins. There's that, a bit of a PR crisis, I think. There is a PR crisis, yeah. and that's maybe what we're here to discuss, that there is that... Um, sort of fierce reductionism yeah. that says, look, if it, unless there's a gene for it, it does, just doesn't but, exist. But anyone seriously under, uh, studying these processes knows that, like, it, it's, it, it, like, gene genetic evolution doesn't even work in this way. And we, like, genetic, like, theories of evolution, I mean, this is areas of Tim and Massimo can develop on, would never, uh, would never dismiss the role that the environment and development play, I think, on, on shaping these behaviors, at least to my knowledge. And, and that's why someone like myself, I study both proximate mechanisms of, say, how children learn um, from their environment and how they transmit culture, uh, as well as these ultimate questions about why we have culture. Okay, um, we're probably going to be more the ultimate question. Can, can I disagree a little bit? Yeah, sure. That'd be my guess. Elab elaborate on the disagreement. Can I get in the disagreement queue as well? Yes, All please. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Take a number. Great. So. Uh, I guess my take is I wish that the field was quite that so, so okay, settled maybe, as you, yeah. you be, we're, you've been describing. But you know, I remember being uh, very, until fairly recently before I moved full time to philosophy, uh, into a, one of the most prestigious evolution departments in the country, mm -hmm. in the United States, uh, and having to fight really hard okay. with some of my colleagues yeah. uh, for them to admit that things like development, oh, really? uh, phenotypic plasticity, yeah. behavioral plasticity and so on and so forth are in fact not just minor annoyances that need to be accounted for yeah. but are major players yeah. in, in I mean I guess I, I come from I'm lucky in a way that I come from a field of comparative and developmental so I'm sort of very right. much slap bang in the right. middle it's so. built in right yeah right. Mm -hmm. the difference is yeah. you spend a lot of time with animals and he spends a lot of time with, with colleagues. academics yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah who can you learn more from yeah yeah uh, <laughs> Tim, did you want so to? So I, I want to be even handed by disagreeing with Massimo and Zana at the same time. <laughs> um, Excellent. So they've, they've both portrayed this image of a fairly static evolutionary theory whereby Darwin says a bunch of things. And then there's a sort of broad inheritance up until maybe a few years ago. Uh, and Massimo's saying, that's a bit weird, right? Do we really think Darwin's right about everything? And Zana's kind of saying, well, maybe Darwin's really onto something. That's why the 
ideas have persisted for so long. It's really important, I think, to understand that Darwin is in many ways quite different, I think, to the theory that we have now. So for podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.